Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Margaret Torn this morning. She's an ecologist and a biogeochemist. And I've been following Margaret's work for many years here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And it's really exciting to see her work progress. She's an expert on the carbon cycle. And so you're gonna hear about uh, climate change and carbon and mathematical models and the work she's done publishing over 100 peer reviewed papers in this topic. She currently is a senior advisor in the climate and ecosystems division uh, in the bioatmospheric interactions program and working with atmospheric research and terrestrial systems. And she co-led the climate and carbon sciences program area in what used to be called the earth sciences division. It's now the um, energy and environmental sciences division. I mean, depart, division, area, it's an area now. And she's also an adjunct professor at UC Berkeley in the energy and resources group. And she's been an, a, an award winner in the Presidential Early Career Award. And she also has an honorary doctorate from the math, Mathematics and Natural Sciences at University of Zurich. So she's been a, a, a pioneer in uh, this topic and I'm looking forward to your comments today. And thank you so much for being able to join us. We've been asking her for years to try to join our event and we finally got her and our Zoom uh, environment is a good, good way for us to have her as part of our event today. So take it away, Margaret. Well, thank you, Marianne. And it's really nice to be here in the virtual sense um, with you all. And I'm going to share my screen and uh, we can get started. So first thing is uh, just a check. You're, yes. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, it's working. Okay, and I'm, oops, I'm gonna move the little thing out of the way and then we can get started. All right. Yeah, so as Marianne said, I am Margaret Torn and good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be joining you here from Berkeley uh, where I work. Uh, I'm also especially happy to be here. I'm talking to you about three perspectives on the global carbon cycle, soil, atmosphere, and energy. Uh, but I'm here also as a community college graduate from long ago, maybe not quite as long ago as this picture, but um, it's been a while, but I'm very grateful to the College of Marin for getting my education started. So I work on the global carbon cycle as a biogeochemist, as Marianne said. So my research entails following the element carbon, and I mean that sort of figuratively and literally as carbon moves into different chemical forms and studying how it passes through different compartments of the biosphere, of uh, soils, of plants, of the atmosphere, uh, how it's moving and what it's doing. So this picture is just showing stocks and flows, uh, showing, a, um, but this is a little bit abstract, I would say. So I'm gonna introduce you to two significant aspects of the carbon cycle that I study. The first I'm sure you're familiar with, the, the greenhouse effect, uh, meaning the role, in this case, the role of CO2 and methane in warming Earth's climate or in moderating the amount of radiation that is re-radiated back to space, uh, not re-radiated back to space, and instead reflected back and re-radiated back to Earth's surface, which affects our climate. Um, I'm going to explain this better and in a little bit more detail later, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, uh, but I should say, because I didn't say that, don't have it showing that actually water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas, but because we're focused on the carbon cycle, I don't have it showing here. Most of my research concerns the terrestrial carbon cycle, the cycle of carbon through plants and the organic matter in soils. And that's important to us for many different reasons. Um, the terrestrial ecosystems right now are a, a carbon sink. It means they're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, net. And that is actually absorbing about 30% of anthropogenic CO2 emissions each year. So the atmospheric CO2 burden is not going up as fast as it would if we didn't have this terrestrial land sink where plants and soil are accumulating carbon. Uh, on the other hand, ecosystems can respond to climate in ways that release more CO2 or methane to the atmosphere, and that can create a positive feedback to climate warming. 
Uh, we depend on terrestrial ecosystem productivity for things like producing biofuels for energy, but maybe nearest and dearest to my heart uh, for food production. And um, it's just, to me, a fascinating complex system to study. So I'm particularly interested in soils, uh, but I'm happy to, to uh, entertain questions on any aspect of this after my presentation. So today I'm gonna to talk about three views on the global carbon cycle. The first is soils as a lens on the worrisome question of positive feedbacks generated by ecosystems and climate that could amplify warming, global warming. The second is looking at the atmosphere and specifically looking at a missing piece, which is direct observational evidence for how greenhouse gases actually create warming in our atmosphere. And then finally, energy, by which I mean, what can we do to reduce CO2 emissions? And we'll talk about that. What I'll do is I'll pause after each segment for just a couple minutes for questions. So, all right, so we'll start our tour with soil. Um, First thing I wanted to say, and the reason, one reason it's so important is that there is three times as much carbon in soil in organic material that was put there, uh, first fixed by plants and then input into soil. There's three times as much of that organic material as there is carbon in CO2 in the atmosphere. So any transfer of carbon from soils to atmosphere has a potential to really change atmospheric CO2 concentrations. It's a relatively stable reservoir with residence times of years to 10,000 of years. Uh, but this organic material can be decomposed by microbes, that's bacteria and fungi. It's decomposed to CO2 and the CO2 returns to the atmosphere. So what happens when soils warm? What happens when climate warms? Uh, what happens to microbial decomposition and that transfer of CO2? And I'm sorry, it's a webinar. I can't see people's faces, but I bet if we were here, I would see that you all have an intuitive sense of what happens because you all have a refrigerator and a freezer. And you know that if you um, put your food in a, in a colder environment, refrigerator or best freezer, that mold, meaning fungal growth or bacterial growth is much slower. So we kind of, know that warming stimulates decomposition. And when warming stimulates decomposition, as we're seeing here, you can get more CO2 leaving the soil as that microbial respiration than plants are taking up. And <clears throat> that leads to more CO2 in the atmosphere. And if that's caused by climate warming, there will be a feedback or a reinforcement to that. So one of the main questions driving my research on soils is, how much and how fast could soil carbon be released to the atmosphere as CO2? Um, it's a complicated question. It's hard to predict with models. And so we need experiments. So for the last six years, I've been developing, pioneering a kind of experiment where we are warming the whole soil profile. This is our field site. It's a coniferous forest in the Sierra Nevada. And we're looking at how warming affects decomposition in the whole profile. So this is just showing where the field site is. The middle is a schematic of sort of modeling, schematic modeling that we did ahead of time to see if we were to put vertical heating rods deep into the soil, could we warm it? So we found that if we put many heating rods around our plots, 2.4 meters deep, um, we could achieve four degrees warming above ambient throughout the whole profile. Where here, the profile that we're warming is about a meter. Um, that doesn't seem very deep, but most soil studies have focused only on this top surface layer. So we wanted to see what's happening down deeper because climate change will warm the whole soil profile. Warming at depth really keeps up with air warming. We can talk about that more if you're interested. Um, I guess this is a good group to talk about heating in unusual space like soil. Maybe you'll have suggestions for me. 
All right, so here's a picture of a research plot. There are 22 vertical heaters surrounding each plot. The plots are three meters in diameter. We have six plots. And we also have a couple um, very shallow cables here in the, near the center to help warm the surface because of course we're recooling, re-radiating the space a little quickly, more quickly at this surface. And then we're measuring all different aspects of the carbon cycle, CO2 efflux to the atmosphere. Uh, we have tension lysimeters to measure dissolved organic carbon movement. We have gas wells. We put in, uh, take little samples to see what's happening with CO2 production at depth and so on. So the first two years of results from this experiment were written up in a paper by postdoc Caitlin Hicks Trees. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of those results, what happens when we warm. So the first thing I want to say is that the heaters worked. They maintain a four degree warming. I'm showing here the difference in warming between the blue, which is the control plots. And maybe I should show you, this is soil depth. I now realize that's an unusual way to have a plot for people who don't study soil. Um, there's the surface at zero. This is a meter deep. We're looking at temperature on the X axis. And so here's the ambient temperature and the control plots going down the soil depth. And here's the soil temperature where it's warmed. It's about four degrees, except at the surface where we get more exchange. All previous studies had only warmed and studied the surface. And so what was happening down here in the deeper horizons was a bit of a mystery, but more than half of the world's soil carbon is below 30 centimeters. So it's actually quite important. So what happened? What we learned is that the warming increased CO2 fluxes to the atmosphere from these plots by 30%. And not only did it increase CO2 efflux by 30, 30%, but quite a bit of this response, about 40%, was generated by the soil and the microbes below 15 centimeters. So below the depth at which most people are studying soil. So this effect has been largely overlooked. And then we wanted to know, that was for the first two years, does this effect persist longer? So now we've been running the experiment for more than five years. And the answer is yes, this effect persists. Uh, the heating is it's still increasing CO2 flux by 30%. It looks like there might've been a slight downturn in 2018, but it's not statistically significant. So this is a fairly large effect. Uh, we looked at 27 other active warming studies, um, but they all focused on shallow soil. And so they weren't warming as much of the soil. And so not surprisingly, they didn't see as much of a cumulative um, response. So this means that if we were basing things on previous models and previous studies, we would be underestimating this effect. So now I wanna wrap up this first segment of my talk and just to take, take home messages, which is that warming, which is simulating a, a climate warming, uh, stimulates decomposition throughout the soil profile. So all of that soil carbon could be destabilized and decomposed by microbes with climate change. And this soil carbon climate feedback may be underestimated by models and previous studies that have only focused on the top thin layer of soil. So I'd like to pause there, see if there's any questions or I can happily um, continue on. Hi, Margaret, we have a question. Um, we know Good. that uh, in the atmosphere, the heat transfer is by convection. So we understand how that works. But uh, in soil, it seems like it's more a different kind of heat transfer. So even if the soil levels at a lower level are uh, warmed, how does that translate working up through the soil? Yes. So first thing I'd say is that uh, conduction is very important in soils. And if soils have water in them, especially, Water is a very good conductor, but also soil is a fairly densely packed medium. So heat, I think I just said the wrong thing. I said soil is conductive. Heat is conductive. <laughs> and um, with climate warming, you actually have the warming of the air, the atmosphere above, 
and that is conducted down to into the soil. The other way that heat is transferred from a warming climate or just from climate into soil is through rainfall. Water has a fairly high heat capacity and it can be warmer than very cold soil. This is true in the Arctic where I work. If you have rain falling, that water is warmer than the ice and permafrost below and it brings a lot of heat into the soil. Um, so that, and then uh, I think they were maybe asking, how are we losing heat off the surface? And um, through those same means, I mean, IR, radiation, some, my little bit of convection to the air, not very little, and convection. Okay, thanks. I think that's all the questions. Like, I'm sorry, we have a couple more questions. Two more, yeah. Um, how does the soil respond to climate change in terms of warming uh, as opposed well, yeah, as opposed to oceans and other structural elements? Oh, uh -huh, that's a good question. I think when we start thinking about the ocean, there's two main effects, and they're not very biological, not to start with anyway. One is ocean circulation, just how is changes in, um, when you warm water, you change the density so at surface, so how is that change in circulation? Uh, the other is that is chemical, that as you warm uh, water that has CO2 in it or liquid, you drive some of that CO2 off. And again, if we go back to the kitchen, you know that from a can of Coke or carbonated water, if you leave it in the fridge, it's gonna hold the bubbles longer. If you put it in a much warmer room, you lose the carbonation. So those are some of the main effects on the ocean. Whereas uh, soil, the main effects are biologically driven by microbes. So we're looking at things like decomposition and nutrient cycling. All right, thank you. And um, would geothermal heat pumps cause this effect of heating uh, the, the earth's soil and um, uh, release more carbon dioxide? Mm. I, I'd have to say sort of as a uh, kind of a global issue, no, not locally where you are heating soil, you know, within meters of, if you have heat pumps that are, and of course you don't want that, you don't want it leaking heat near the surface. You want it to come up to the building where you want that heat. But um, I think that would be a very local phenomenon. However, there's other people uh, on this webinar who will be better able to answer that question. Okay. Um, we have a question, a simple question of uh, what percent of the atmospheric carbon dioxide is attributable to soil decomposition, I suppose, in contrast to the rest of it? What is the oh, yeah. relative balance? Right. That is a, a great question, but a, actually a very hard question because the carbon cycle is a cycle. And so um, as we're seeing in this picture on the slide that I'm showing, You've got soil carbon being respired to CO2. CO2 is also continually being taken up by plants. It's exchanging with the atmosphere. And so it's hard to attribute a, an, a given increase to one part of this process. Um, but in the future, if there's warming and if this 30% effect that I'm talking about does take place, uh, that could lead to an effect that's about uh, 20% of what the anthropogenic increase will look like. So actually a very large number. Right, that's uh, yes. are significant numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, the last question is, uh, can you just briefly summarize how carbon is bound in the soil and released through warming? I think yeah. you kind of danced oh. around that just to- Yes, I did, and like thank you. Because that's actually more what I, I study. So when plants photosynthesize, they form tissues like leaves, wood, uh, grasses, that material and roots. That material dies or is shed by the plant in the fall. So it's this nice organic tissue. It's incorporated into the soil as little small organic molecules. Those molecules can absorb to mineral surfaces that stabilizes them for a long time or microbes, that's the bacteria and the fungi kind of eat in a sense that organic material, they get energy and carbon from it, just like we would if we ate it, but they do it by kind of 
just absorbing it through all their cell wall. Uh, and then they die or they produce compounds, but either way, their cell wall material becomes most of the organic matter that's in soil. So when they want to metabolize it to get carbon or get energy, they're breaking it down and respiring CO2. And it's really just like we do that. So that, thank you for asking that question. Thank you so much. And uh, now we're eager to hear the rest of your talk. All right. So now we know warming soils can release more CO2 to the atmosphere. And so the next part of this is, um, how does that CO2 affect our climate? I'm going to return to this picture and this kind of very, I think, very familiar concepts. Uh, but just as a very quick refresher, um, <clears throat> sunlight uh, warms the surface of the Earth. But as we know, Earth doesn't just keep getting warmer, warmer, warmer. Uh, as things warm, they also re radiate infrared radiation, and they radiate at, as the sun radiates, they radiate and radiation at wavelengths proportional to the temperature, uh, determined by the temperature, I should say. And some of that heat then escapes to space. But if you have gases in the atmosphere that are able to absorb infrared radiation, they will absorb that infrared radiation in molecular uh, motion and re-radiate it back. And that release and some of that infrared radiation then is uh, radiated back down to space, to, to Earth. And we actually receive more radiation on the surface than had it escaped without any greenhouse gases. Uh, so we know this. We know the physics of it pretty well. Um, there are good models and physical um, descriptions of the full spectra of re-radiation by CO2 and, and methane, we have that here, um, back to Earth's surface. But there had not been empirical confirmation of exactly how increasing CO2 was affecting downwelling radiation to Earth's surface in the actual atmosphere and not in a lab. That plus this graph motivated the study I want to tell you about. Um, so we all know CO2 concentrations are going up. This is a famous Keeling curve, it's called, named after Ralph Keeling, who, or Dave Keeling, who started this, um, these measurements. Uh, he and his son has carried them on. So we see CO2 increasing over time. That's due to anthropogenic emissions of fossil fuel from cement manufacturing, from uh, land use change. But what you'll also see on this plot that's of interest to me as a terrestrial biogeochemist, these little sawtooths. These sawtooths are variation in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere each winter and summer, driven by the terrestrial biosphere. In the summer, we have plant photosynthesis is dominant and it draws down CO2. And in the winter, respiration is the dominant process and uh, CO2 concentrations go up. So this little sawtooth is the kind of breathing of the biosphere or that balance between um, respiration and photosynthesis. So we wanted to use both that trending increase and the little sawtooth to look at the observed empirically, the effect of atmospheric CO2 through the whole atmospheric column on the infrared radiation absorbed at the Earth's surface and that additional radiation from the trend in CO2 is called radiative forcing. Radiative forcing is the term that the IPCC and climate scientists give to that additional climate warming or forcing that we're getting from enhanced CO2 over pre-industrial. And the uh, fancy radiative um, calculations were done by Dan Feldman and Bill Collins, shown here in a sort of paper published in 2015, and then we have a second paper that's published on methane a few years later. So the study was enabled by the Department of Energy having two research sites, one in the Southern Great Plains, one on the North Slope of Alaska, that contain a very specialized instrument that measures all the wavelengths of downwelling radiation very finely. It was also enabled by work that Sebastian Barode and 
I was doing, uh, measuring atmospheric CO2 through the whole profile. So we were able to do two different things and putting them together, uh, come up with this empirical test. And it's really a neat, elegant experiment that was designed by uh, Bill Collins did the experimental design piece. So the instrument is called the ARI. And this instrument measures wavelengths. And as what we're showing on the right here is an actual measured spectrum through wavelengths. And you can see in red here, all of the absorption and now re-radiation of the same wavelengths in the infrared, low wave number, uh, low wave number wavelengths. Uh, so this is measuring long wave spectra. So this was done continuously for 10 years at those two sites. You can also simulate what that spectra ought to be by using other data by using the physics that we know for the greenhouse effect. So one is to, to understand the temperature of the atmosphere, and that was determined by radio sons, uh, to understand the atmospheric water vapor profile from microwave, and then to look at the composition in greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane. So the, data, the little plot shown there is actually ours from our flights. And then you take these data and you use them in a very finely resolved line-by-line -line radiative transfer model and you should come up with something like what we were actually measuring with ARI. Now, what if atmospheric CO2 had not been going up, didn't have this shape here, but instead was flat? Well, then over the 10 years of measurement, we really shouldn't expect that the radiative forcing was going up. So this was the test. So we have our observed long wave spectra. We have a counterfactual, which says if, if CO2 uh, wasn't affecting radiation, then we shouldn't see any trend. We could subtract uh, the observed long wave spectra from what we'd model if we held CO2 constant. And that difference, that residual is the spectra that's due to the growth or change in atmospheric CO2 concentration. And it looks like this. What you're seeing here is the, uh, the gray is our measured CO2. The red is the forcing that is measured by the airy spectrometer. And so what you see very clearly is the trend um, of increasing radiative forcing due to atmospheric CO2 and that it follows the measured CO2. And this is not surprising, but it was actually the first time that this, either of these effects had been uh, demonstrated. One, the effect of the trend, the long-term trend in atmospheric CO2 concentration from anthropogenic release, and just the effect of ecosystem process in drawing down and releasing atmospheric CO2 seasonally. How was that changing radiative forcing? And as you can tell, the effects are quite large total forcing from 1750 to 2011, and that's about, um, maybe not remembering this right, it's about going from 270 ppm to I think 370, 370 something ppm CO2 was 1.8 watts per meter squared. Um, but the seasonal cycle is actually quite large. It's 0.5 watts per meter squared. So it's showing that the biosphere is having an effect uh, over time, not, over seasonal cycles, but kind of balancing out, and that the anth anthropogenic trend of about 0.2 watts per meter squared in this decade is quite detectable over that signal. So this was, as I mentioned, that first observational confirmation of the effect of CO2 on the surface energy balance, but it completely confirmed theoretical predictions, and the trends match the trends in atmospheric CO2 so the take home message here is that the physics of the greenhouse effect are well understood and can be empirically verified. All right, so that was again another 15 minute chunk. I'm gonna pause here in case there's any questions. Uh, don't ask me about the line by line code, please, because I won't 
be able uh, to. Margaret, we don't have any questions yet, but I think All right. the in yellow is, is really profound, that the absolute, the physics are well understood, well documented, yeah. and, and empirically verified. That is, that is a profound statement. Yeah. And so it's worthy of a moment just to, just to look at it. Um, it is. Uh, these are not things we're depending on models for. We're not, um, yeah, this is not a guess. Uh, you can, we know. <laughs> and you can measure it. You can measure with instruments that uh, you can sort of verify yourself. Uh, the measurement I use, the instrument I use to measure CO2, you can breathe in it and you see the CO2 go up. I mean, it's very intuitive. You know everything's working. You know, um, yeah, this is what's happening. And it's not a sampling error. It's not, it, it's, it's yes. rock yeah. solid. Yeah. That, that's impressive. Yeah, we're, we have any thousands of measurements went into, independent measurements went into what I was showing you. That's, that's it's insights. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you uh, about DOE. I imagine your funding sort of goes up and down in this, in this topic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, like a seasonal cycle I was showing you. And you've been able to sort of maintain it or are you, and, and sort of, you don't have to go into details, but sort of at a high level. Um, no, I'll just say that um, actually our funding <clears throat> has been remarkably uh, steady, surprisingly steady over the Bush years, who was not so friendly sometimes to say energy efficiency. Uh, but. Fortunately, the, um, in the last four years, uh, Congress chose not to pay attention to the president's budget request, and they did what the Congress thought was the best thing to do, and that maintained steady funding. Mm -hmm. DOE has maintained its commitment to studying. They started out this whole line of work by studying the environmental impacts of energy use. So that led them to CO2, and they were actually, DOE, a pioneer in studying carbon and carbon dioxide. Margaret, yeah. we do have one additional question, and that is a question about any sources of CO2 beyond anthropomorphic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> there are, from the, we think back to the first part of the talk, uh, there are always CO2 being released from soils and also from land, natural land disturbance. Uh, like wildfire disease, so we get trans and forest die or die back. That's a transfer. Um, volcanoes naturally were and geologically are a source of CO2 to the atmosphere at about 0.3 petagrams per year compared to a, the current anthropogenic release for fossil fuel, which is about nine. So 0.3 versus nine. So this is a big perturbation that we have right now. Yeah. Oh, you are muted, Jamie, in this world of Zoom. That's fine. I'm turning off my video and, and ah. sending it back to you. <laughs> All right, so we'll continue on our grand tour, our global tour of the carbon cycle. All right, so now we have the final piece uh, confirmed that CO2 traps as much radiation as we projected it would. And now we're to, how do we stop that trend of increasing CO2 concentrations? So <clears throat> to avoid the worst of anthropogenic climate change, the IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded that we have to stay below 1.5 degrees warming. Uh, some people say less, but in any case, just achieving this goal requires that our global societal greenhouse gas balance is net neutral by 2050. Uh, that on net, we don't release more CO2 to the atmosphere. There can be some gross emissions, but there's gotta be some compensation. And our now uh, certified president-elect, Joe Biden, has made carbon neutrality by 2050 a center of his environmental platform. Uh, that also reminds me to pause that like you, I, I have to say this has been a you know, unprecedented, strange, pretty awful uh, 48 hours. And um, if I'm moving a little slow today, I don't know if I am, I was a little distracted yesterday as I'm sure you all were too. Nevertheless, this still is facing us as an important question. 
uh, to deal with. And the questions that we focused on in terms of how do we get there, one is can the US reach net zero CO2 emissions from energy and industry by 2050? Can we do it with sort of commercial and near commercial technology? Do we have the means in hand? Is it feasible? Uh, what is the least cost pathway and how much would that cost? And what would be the impact of behavior like uh, more energy efficiency and energy efficient behaviors, lowering demand, or if we sort of tie one hand behind our back and limit decarbonization options, uh, which we might choose to do as a society, for example, if we don't wanna build more nuclear power. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about results from a study that'll be published this month, January, 2021, in the AGU or American Geophysical Union Premier Journal, AGU Advances. It's called Carbon Neutral Pathways for the United States. And the core modeling that was done for this study and our sort of team that uh, we work with was the Evolved Energy Research Group. I'm showing here Jim Williams, Ryan Jones, Ben Haley. You may have heard yesterday from Erin, uh, and I apologize, I'm forgetting her last name, who was talking about the Princeton study. Actually, Evolved Energy did all the fine scale modeling, did the modeling of the energy system for the Princeton study uh, as well. So some of the methods are the same. Uh, you may have heard then about energy pathways in Rio model, but basically the energy pathways model, which was first designed by Jim Williams and I published a paper in Science uh, in 2012 and had a US report in 2014 on it. Um, it's a very finely resolved energy system model. It divides the US into 16 regions. It, it measures the stock it, and projects the stock and rollover of all the infrastructure, every power plant, the uh, electric, the um, vehicle fleet, every space heater for commercial buildings and so on, space heating for commercial buildings. And then there's an optimal optimization model to both handle the electricity uh, reliability, but also to optimize costs. So I just wanna say a quick word about the scenarios and sort of what we, the challenge that we set ourselves. We said we have to supply the same energy services as the EIA forecast for buildings, transportation industry. We have to allow GDP to grow as projected, population to grow as expected. Um, minimize, we have infrastructure inertia, meaning minimize early retirement so that we don't have the cost of stranded assets, maintain full electrical liability, and not uh, require uh, a miracle. This is technology that we have pretty much in hand. And so we looked at a, many different cases. We have a least cost pathway, the central case to carbon neutrality. That was pretty much technology agnostic and just uh, tried to find the least expensive way to do this. And that's the case I'll focus on, but we also evaluated cost sensitivities. So high and low fossil fuel prices and high and low technology costs like solar. Then we also looked at various constraints. <clears throat> One would be limits on the amount of land available for renewable energy and biomass. You probably heard yesterday how much land is taken, would be required for uh, decarbonization build out. Uh, what if consumers don't wanna buy electrical electricity using end uses like EVs? Um, what if consumers can reduce demand? Uh, what if we decide we're gonna go 100% renewable primary energy and not have any nuclear? So that's that scenario. And can we even achieve net negative emissions? So, <clears throat> excuse me one second. <clears throat> uh, so here we have the uh, emissions targets on the left, the annual CO2 emissions. So we have the, on the left is the reference case. That's kind of the business as usual case to 2050. On the right is the emission target that we set for reaching zero or net neutral at um, by 2050. And on the right are the cumulative CO2 emissions. I'll just say that meeting the target on the right means that cumulatively released about half as much CO2. 
as we would have in the business as usual case. So we were able to develop pathways that meet this very steep goal. Um, and so what I wanted to first say is that all the scenarios that I showed mentioned before, we achieved those goals. And all of them required the four basic same principles. So if you're going to take one thing home from this talk, it's possible. And here are the four things we need to do. And these four principles, they're not just principles, but they're also benchmarks that the US would have to meet by 2050 in order to achieve these ambitious decarbonization goals. First, we have to generate electricity uh, without releasing carbon, so decarbonize electricity. And in fact, we need a 95% reduction in emissions intensity. We need to reduce energy demand for the services that we require and at least a 40% reduction in per capita final energy demand. And that is included, including energy uh, industrial processes. The remaining demand has to be met with that decarbonized electricity. So electricity has to replace fuels and other combustion to power our economy and our, and our world. So there's a 300% increase in the share of total energy that's coming from electricity. That means you have to have appliances, vehicles, and so on that use electricity as their fuel, as their source of energy. And finally, to achieve these three goals, and I have to say, even with the success in those goals, carbon capture is required. Uh, we can get to an 80% reduction of 1990 levels without carbon capture, but we can't get to net zero. So that means that we have CO2 capture from fossil fuel exhaust streams, as well as direct air capture from the atmosphere. And not all of this CO2 has to be sequestered. As you can see, a lot of it is actually utilized because in an economy where you are not using fossil fuel and you need to generate natural gas, synthetic natural gas or hydrogen as fuel, you have to first use capture of CO2 from the atmosphere to get the feedstock that you need. So what does the transformation look like? Um, these plots are called Sankey diagrams. The left side is the reference case that business as usual. It's what the atmosphere, it's what the economy looks like now in 2020. So I'm sorry, I should call it, this is the 2020 current case. This is 2050 with that central or lowest cost case. Uh, for each of these plots, the left side is showing primary energy, the right side is showing final energy, and the middle is showing all the different transformations that the energy goes through in form to get to that final use. The thickness of the line is showing you energy flow in exajoules. So the first thing to notice is that the 2050 central case is just a lot shorter. <laughs> than the 2020 reference. It means overall energy use has gone down a lot. Second, the fossil fuel sources here have shrunk to very little petroleum, a little natural gas. Second, what's in their place, third, what's in their place is fossil, it's a solar and wind, so the renewable energy case. And a lot of transformation, the one I wanted to point out especially is the amount of electricity that is now going to fuel production. So using electricity, for example, over generation that would have been curtailed to produce hydrogen, uh, methane for fuels for liquid transportation and industry. So a lot of, okay. Um, I won't have time to go into it today, but um, it's also possible to have 100% renewable case, and in this case, uh, nuclear was phased out by 2050. So there's a lot more wind and solar. It takes up a lot of land space, uh, and there's a bit more biomass in that case. So I said that decarbonization was a transition of, uh, I should say, is a transformation of infrastructure. And um, I don't have uh, very much time left, so I'm going to I don't think maybe Marianne or Jamie can just tell me if I've got 10 minutes or closing in on five. Oh, you have 10 yeah. minutes easily. 
Oh, great. Okay. Oh, I guess we've already had some Q&A. So no, my... no, this is great. And you're I... really hitting some important okay. stuff. Keep going. All right. Great. So um, the syst energy system transformation that was sort of illustrated by those Sankey diagrams is achieved by transforming infrastructure. And this slide is showing infrastructure that is involved in two thirds of US CO2 emissions. So electricity generation, vehicles and buildings, residential and commercial, but this is only showing residential. So let me just show a few numbers to highlight the uh, sheer magnitude of this infrastructure overhaul. So first, our electric capacity triples here. If we look at vehicles, um, nearly 300 million new electric vehicles must be added to the fleet. Of the 296 cars and light trucks, there are 280 million, I should have said 296 million cars and light trucks, more than 280 million are battery operated EVs in this scenario. Uh, similarly for heat pumps, um, they become very widespread for space and water heating. Uh, 119 million out of 147 million space heating uh, devices are heat pumps. And for water heating, 88 million out of 153 million installed devices would need to be heat pumps. And then electric res resistance heaters make up most of the reminder, remainder. And the story for commercial buildings is similar. And Marianne and other experts can tell us a lot more about that. But um, I do want to say here, when we're looking at the electric capacity, and all of these that the idea is to change that each new purchase has to be pushing us in the right direction because you have to get um, natural turnover to work for you or it becomes very expensive. Uh, these pathways avoid early retirement. They use the natural lifetime. Uh, the only early retirement was coal. Um, spending. <coughs> um, so we might wonder, what does it cost? So this, this graph is showing historical energy system cost as a percent of GDP for the last 50 years, or almost 50 years. It's been quite variable. You can see the oil price shocks there. Um, but energy as a, as a percentage of our GDP is going down. And it will go down even if we are mitigating climate change. It just won't go down by quite as much. So, uh, but that depends on what we assume about future fuel price as well. So let's just summarize saying that the net cost of a carbon neutral energy system is about 0.2 to 1.2% of GDP in 2050. And that's across many of these different cases. We actually project um, that you could have a net uh, savings at some of the time, um, but it's generally slightly higher than business as usual, but st still near the low end of historical energy spending in the US. And um, increased investment in the zero carbon technologies, which is quite a lot, but is offset by reductions in fossil fuel spending and also what's missing, what's offset here is the great volatility in fossil fuel prices, which can go up, which are a source of international uh, policy concern. Um, this projects that a world that depends on capital investment for um, in the decarbonized scenario has a much more steady and predictable amount of cost going to energy as compared to a fossil fuel driven economy. Um, I'm not going to say very much about fuels, except to say that um, not everything can be powered directly by electricity. Uh, for example, we might need to use hydrogen fuels, or hydrocarbon fuels. Now, those could be derived from electricity. Margaret, uh, I'm going to yeah. jump in real quick. Um, you're getting a few questions coming up, so uh, and you've got about five minutes left. So I'll let you All right. have some time. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm going to skip the rest of this, except to say that fuels are still important. And that's one of the reasons, the point I want to make is that carbon capture is still necessary. 
even in a 100% renewable energy case where you may not need to sequester carbon because you're not scrubbing it from a, a waste stream, but you still need CO2 for power to gas and power to liquids uh, in that scenario. So that's the point I wanted to make. So um, in 20 seconds, let me just say that although there's uncertainty about some of the out years for the next decade, we know what needs to be done. So this is really good for policymakers. There are clear benchmarks that we need to reach in the next 10 years by 2030, but I don't have time to go through them. And I'll summarize by saying it's feasible to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions from US energy and industry while supporting economic growth and energy services. Those, the constraints raise costs, uh, but we have clear guidance on what we need to do now, just regardless of which scenario we're gonna follow. Carbon capture is always required to provide carbon feedstock, to allow carbon neutral fossil fuels, especially in the interim, and to offset any residual fossil fuel use. <coughs> and there's very large land use, which is something that I'm working on more. Uh, let's see. I think I won't tell you this, just to say that a, an artist has made a really beautiful rendition of one of the Sankey diagrams. So that'll be the cover of the uh, AGU Advances article. And I thank you for listening to three views on the carbon cycle. Margaret, that was tremendous. That was, yeah, it, 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 we've been trying to get you for a long time uh, because the yep. folks here are looking at building operations and how we can make them more efficient. And this just framed it beautifully. We really appreciate it. We have quite a few questions. Okay. Um, so a couple of things. One is we will get through the questions that we can, and then we have the capability of having a meet the speaker afterwards. Do you have a few, do you have time to yeah. stick around? Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so there, there is a meet the speaker uh, option in the, uh, in the structure of this workshop. Um, so if we don't get through everything, we'll, we'll work to get, get this uh, set up. Um, there was an estimate of, uh, there was a question about embodied <coughs> energy in the model um, and whether there was an estimate of the percentage of uh, embodied energy. I think this is going back further in your talk. Yeah, so um, there is in the sense that all, all industrial activity, so all production of a new power plant or, or everything was accounted for, um, but Imports, embodied energy and imports is a more complicated picture. Right, let's yep. shift that one to, um, yeah. to the meet the speaker section yeah. for a little more elaboration. Um, there's a yeah. question here about the negative impact from natural gas and coal, electricity production, fossil fuel and internal combustion engines and so forth. But what is the negative impact uh, uh, or the carbon footprint of producing from energy sources such as solar panels and batteries? and kind of uh, maybe a measure of that with respect to the fossil fuel. So the part of this then follows from the previous question on embodied energy. So you had to produce that solar panel. So that takes energy, land and materials. Uh, the materials are actually quite small. The land footprint for producing the solar panel is quite small. But solar panels and wind have a larger um, footprint on the land than, than other forms of energy. Um, not quite as bad as you'd think if you take into account the coal, coal mining or nuclear power refining and so on. But you still have a very large land footprint. And I think that's going to be the main environmental issue with solar and wind is how do we balance land use between renewable energy build out and very other very important demands for land like biodiversity and habitat conservation, growing food, where people are going to decide to live. This is going to be the really big issue, I think, in achieving this transformation. And a former PhD student of mine, Grace Wu, has done really incredible work on how do we optimize planning for protecting habitat and locating 
re uh, renewable energy where in areas of high resource. That, that's always a question, but especially now. <coughs> Going to be Sorry. infrastructure that may preclude yeah. um, the use of the land otherwise. Um, we had a question about um, whether no early retirement meant fewer building retrofits. No, it does okay. not. It's it early retirement of the power plants, right? Well, we meant no early retirement, but it means tremendous amount of building retrofit. You have yeah. to bring the building stock yeah. to very low energy and you have to. So <clears throat> the idea was that you shouldn't have to replace your building heating system, your HVAC system early, but when you have to replace it, you have to replace it with something that uses electricity as its source of energy, but not, not retire the entire building. But you have but Janie, to. I, yeah. the, Margaret, that was an excellent talk as Janie said, and you were getting all kinds of uh, chats from people that are thanking you for it. Um, I'm going to uh, interject a really quickly before you head out to that breakout room, Janie. Uh, the, we have a, um, a booth. LBL has a booth that involves somebody who's going to be there today between 1130 and 1230. And LBL offers community college internships sponsored by the Department of Energy to help bring community college students into DOE workforce. So I'd encourage folks if they're interested in learning about that, to visit the LBNL booth. Um, and that will have somebody there today, 1130 to 1230. So that's a quick commercial. And the important distinction is this year, we haven't missed the deadline. The deadline is the 12th of January. So this is really a great opportunity um, for you or for your students to check in and find out what's going on and what, what, what you can do. Uh, Margaret, I, I think we're gonna defer the other questions to the breakout room. I, You've really gotten an overwhelming uh, response on your talk and just an excellent talk. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And Marianne can answer a lot of all the building questions better than I can. So yeah, more time to discuss that later. Right. I have a talk this afternoon and I'll mention some of these things. So lo looking forward to that discussion and come to that session to learn more about the building's role. All right. Thanks. Right. And we're going to... I, we really hate to wrap this up, but we're gonna we're gonna put a pause on this. The next speaker okay. is talking about a model that fits right in line with this, and we're we're it's such a great start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Margaret.